I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates, and today we're going to be talking about new information that we have from the uh, impeachment inquiry, from the House impeachment inquiry. And I also want to talk about another story um, that I should have talked about the other day. And as with so many things, me doing the right thing began with getting called out on Twitter. And uh, what happened was someone, um, someone noted the fact that I talked about the impeachment the other day on TYTI Daily and um, said something along the lines of, stop getting your marching orders from MSNBC, meaning stop, stop uh, doing my streams based on what MSNBC is doing. And that prompted me to coin the term MSNBC splaining, which you're all free to use. I encourage it. Um, just because if you don't know my background, I spent eight years at MSNBC. So, um, so I found that highly uh, bemusing. Um, so, uh, but the, the point was accurate. The point was fair, right? That climate change doesn't get enough doesn't get enough coverage. And I thought about any number of defensive responses, but I also thought, you know what? And w well, actually, one of my defensive res responses was, well, everyone knows that on Monday, the Trump administration sort of, uh, you know, filed the paperwork to pull out from the Paris Accords. So what else is there to say? And then I thought, well, the reason I don't know what else there is to say is because I haven't done the work. I haven't read in on it. So I, I did, and I want to talk about it today first before we get to the impeachment stuff. So if you can't handle news about the impending um, eco-death of the human biosphere, then you might want to fast forward to the fun uh, Perry Mason uh, document dive on uh, impeachment. But I hope, you'll, I hope you'll come for the funny headline about quid pro quo, but stay for the end of the human race. Um, so with that, I, I apologize for if this is uh, uh, bait and switching, click bait and switch, I guess. Uh, but I'm going to start off with a quick thought about climate change. So on Monday, the Trump administration filed its official paperwork saying we're pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords. Fittingly, it will start a process that will culminate one year from now, one day after Election Day, in which the United States will formally end, complete its, the, the pullout of the U.S. participation in the Climate Accord. And this will be portrayed a lot over the coming year and after the fact as a uniquely Trumpian failure. And, and uh, even when Democrats, assuming they get an office and assuming they try, even when Democrats uh, pursue, to whatever extent they do, new international accords on climate change, right? Because it's not, it's not just about the U.S. doing better in terms of emission and controlling greenhouse glass gases, let alone reducing greenhouse gases. It's also about not being the leading indicator for the less developed world to justify uh, and rationalize their own coal and their own emissions. The U.S. participation creates uh, a ceiling beyond which other nations, obviously there are exceptions for developing nations, but it basically brings down the average of what global emissions will be, not just because of its own reduction, but because other nations are now pressured to meet their own uh, ceilings. This is not uniquely due to Trump. And the narrative that Trump is a unique aberrational force within, the United, within U.S. politics, within the Republican Party, is a toxic false one. And I wanted to address something in the bottom, very bottom, of a very good New York Times write-up on the pullout from the climate exchange. I'm going to read you the last three paragraphs, and then I'm going to, if, if my point isn't already clear by then, I'm going to make it again. Quote, analysts cautioned that even if the United States elects a Democrat in 2020, re-entry into the Paris Accords will not necessarily go smoothly. The Paris Agreement is the second global climate change pact that the United States joined under a Democrat and abandoned under a Republican. George W. Bush 
withdrew the United States from the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Jonathan Pershing, who served during the Obama administration as the State Department's Special Envoy for Climate Change, said a Democrat rejoining the Paris Agreement would likely be expected to deliver a specific suite of policies showing how the United States intended to move away from fossil fuels. Even then, per Pershing said, other countries would be rightly wary that the pendulum of support for climate action could swing back in another election cycle. The United States will have to live with that lingering mistrust, Mr. Pershing said. Quote, the United States has been written off in many cases as a partner. He said, quote, you just can't count on them. So the effect of Trump's pullout from the Paris Accord is not just going to be a, a lost year, right, of um, Democrats trying to negotiate a re-entry, the terms of that re-entry, the, the, the leverage that the United States can wield regarding the rest of the world, no matter how uh, uh, evangelistic and committed a uh, climate change fighter is in the White House, all of that, all of that will be artificially suppressed. The effectiveness diminished the power of it dampened, not because Trump pulled out, but because Bush pulled out. That's the entire point that Pershing is making there, that Trump wasn't an aberration, that we have a pendulum. Democrats get in power, clean up the air, literally. We're seeing right now decade-long uh, decreases in air quality, in, in pollution are being reversed right now under Trump. Same thing with the commitment to climate change. It's not just Trump, it's also Bush. And Bush's legacy will mean that no matter how, how committed an advocate we have for, for the environment in office, their credibility, the, the, reli the US reliability for decades to come will still be poisoned by the fact, by the very fact that Trump is not an aberration. I also wanted to make the point that um, Bush behind the scenes post-presidency is helping Trump with his agenda, right? He, he, he banged on a lot of doors, right? This is what moves George W. Bush today to civic activism. He banged on a lot of doors to get Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. And that's not just a favor for buddy Brett Kavanaugh, right? Who, if I remember correctly, worked in the Bush White House. That's writing a blank check to Tr Donald Trump to do whatever he wants that might reach the Supreme Court. And we are seeing very serious, case, very serious cases with exactly those implications heading for the Supreme Court right now. So this idea that Bush is an aberration, he didn't just put a Republican on the Supreme Court, help to make that happen. He did it knowing that he was enabling carte blanche for, for Trump to write his own check going, going forward. So... You don't get to say that Trump is an aberration when the previous Republican president is making it all happen even now to this day. So with that said, let's talk about the new developments in uh, efforts to remove the current Republican president. We now have revised testimony from the ambassador, the US ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland, in which he backtracks on the testimony he gave last month. So we have uh, a three-page revised statement that he submitted to the House committees conducting the impeachment inquiries. And we're going to read a few of the uh, selections here to talk about what they mean. And also because I want to make some points that we're not really hearing in some of the coverage. And that's not a knock on the coverage. There's a lot to go into. I'm just choosing to make some points that, that I have not seen hit in the mainstream media. Uh, so the first thing Sondland says in this new statement is, I have reviewed the October 22nd, 2019 opening statement of Ambassador William Taylor. That was the uh, top U.S. diplomat in Ukraine. I have also reviewed the October 31st, 2019 opening statement of Tim Morrison. That was the National Security Council guy in the White House. These two opening statements have refreshed my recollection about certain conversations in early September 2019. 
in the most cynical reading, refreshed my recollection is a tidy, neat little euphemism for I didn't know that they were going to go as far as they went, so I only went a certain amount, and now that I've seen how far they went, I'm going to go just as far as I can to line myself up with them, but we'll see how far I'm willing to go down the road. And I do want to get to the White House response to this because they seem to be making certain assumptions about the meaning of Sondland's newly revised statement. Skipping ahead now, he says, I now do recall a conversation on September 1st, 2019. And keep in mind, we're talking about two months ago. Now I recall that two months ago conversation that I was asked about under oath in Congress. I do now recall a, a conversation in Warsaw with Mr. Yermak, that's the aide to uh, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. This brief pull aside conversation pull aside meaning this was on a trip with Mike Pence, who was having a larger, uh, longer conversation with Zelensky, which is a thing I just explained to you, even though the, the statement is about to explain that, so I apologize. This brief pull aside conversation followed the larger meeting involving Vice President Pence and President Zelensky, in which President Zelensky had raised the issue of the suspension of US aid to Ukraine directly with Vice President Pence. After that large meeting, I now recall oh yeah, speaking individually with Mr. Yermak, where I said that resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine provided the public, 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 public anti-corruption statement that we had been discussing for many weeks. Again, if you're new to my spiel here, the reason I repeated public, public was because that was the key. They didn't need an investigation. They needed a public statement that they could then hang a rhetorical hat on in domestic U.S. politics by saying, look at that in totally independent investigation going on, which they can only do if it's public. public. Uh, I also recall some question as to whether the public statement could come from the newly appointed Ukrainian prosecutor general rather than from President Zelensky directly. In other words, Zelensky was very, very eager to distance himself from this as much as he could. So there was some pushback saying, uh, maybe it would be more appropriate if we just have the prosecutor general do that. And why would that be a problem for Ukraine, for the United States, right? The reason is because the more, the higher up it comes, the more attention it's liable to get in the U.S. Soon, soon thereafter, I came to understand <laughs> I came to understand. It's, again, um, what, what I came to understand means in legalese is I welcome you to subpoena me again to explain how I came to do that. Um, he's alighting uh, how he came to understand this. And, and he's advertising that he's alighting it. So basically he's saying... Yeah, there's more, and I guess if you make me come back, I'll tell you. Soon thereafter, I came to understand that, in fact, the public, public, public statement would need to come directly from President Zelensky himself. That's a very specific thing to come to understand, right? Um, I, I, you know, when I was a young man, I came to understand certain things about the world. I never came to understand that public statements had to come from President Zelensky. <laughs> I do not specifically recall, I do not specifically recall, there's, there's, um, there's a technique that I believe came out of the FBI called statement analysis, where you very, very minutely, granularly parse a statement to assess its truth value. When you say, I do not specifically recall how I learned this, Instead of saying, I do not recall how I learned this, the word specifically is doing the work there of qualifying the lack of recall. It's saying there is a certain way in which I do not recall this. And the only reason you add the fact that, that there is a certain way you don't recall this is to suggest, by implication, there is a certain other way in which you do recall this. And again, I welcome your future subpoenas. <laughs> 
I'm having too much fun today. I do not specifically recall how I learned this, meaning how I learned that the statement would have to come from President Zelensky, but I believe the information may have come either from Mr. Giuliani or Ambassador Volker. Ambassador Volker was the diplomat charged with overseeing the, U, uh, uh, the Ukraine conflict. Who may have discussed this with Mr. Giuliani? Uh, in a later conversation with Ambassador Taylor, I told him I had been mistaken about whether a public statement could come from the Prosecutor General. I had come to understand that the public statement would have to come from President Zelensky himself. Finally, as of this writing, oh, and by the way, this coming to understand that the public statement would have to come from uh, Zelensky, that comes before the famous text message that Sondland sent to Taylor telling him there's no quid pro quo, which we now understand was him just passing on Trump's claim that there's no pro quid pro quo, which came during the same phone call in which Trump said, there's no quid pro quo, and by the way, this is the quid I want, and that's the quo they need to give me for it. Sondland continues, or recontinues, since the whole thing is a continuation of his previous testimony. Finally, as of this writing, I cannot recall, oh no, wait, he doesn't say I cannot recall, he says I cannot specifically recall. I cannot specifically recall if I had one or two phone calls with President Trump in the September 6th to 9th time frame. And here's the part I wanted to call out that I haven't seen gain any attention. Despite repeated requests to the White House and the State Department, I have not been granted access to all of the phone records. <laughs> okay, well, that tells us something right there. And I would like to review those phone records along with any notes and other documents that may exist to determine if I can provide more complete testimony to assist Congress. Now again, the cynical reading here is, again, find out how far others have been willing to go, find out how far the documentary evidence goes, and then go as far as you need to, to bridge that gap and protect yourself from a perjury charge without having to go further, right? Uh, it's, it's the classic, well, why don't you tell me what you want to know kind of approach here. And it's not being handled in a very sophisticated way. But it also tells us, it tells us a couple things. One, even internally, the White House and State Department are, are not letting people have access to this documentary evidence. But also, Sondland presumably has, has access to his own phone. Um, you can check and see when you got incoming calls that started with 202, um, that, 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 you know, popped up on your, your screen as President Trump. You yourself can go back and check that, Ambassador Sondland, and why wouldn't you, unless first you want to know what records are other people in possession of and willing to share. However, although I have no specific recollection of phone calls during this period with Ambassador Taylor or Minister Morrison, I have no reason to question the substance of their recollection about my September 1 conversation with Mr. Yermak. That's the Zelensky aide. So, a couple other quick points uh, that I wanted to filch. I mean, um, based on some other reporting out there today from Politico. Politico refers to some new email, excuse me, text messages that were also released yesterday in conjunction with the new statement from Sondland. The transcripts released by impeachment investigators on Tuesday were accompanied by a tranche of text messages chronicling communications among Sondland and Volker and Taylor. In one exchange, Volker sent Yermak the precise language that the U.S. wanted Zelensky to use when he announced public, public. Trump's preferred investigations. So here's the, here's the exact quote of what the United States wanted Zelensky to say. Quote, special attention should be paid to the problem of interference in the political processes of the United States, especially with the alleged involvement of some Ukrainian polit politicians. I, this is Zelensky talking, according to the statement the US wanted him to read, I, Zelensky, want to declare that this is unacceptable we intend to initiate and complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes, including those involving Burisma and the 2016 U.S. elections, which in turn will prevent the recurrence of this problem in the future. So I talked yesterday about, and I've talked ceaselessly, 
about the fact that we know Trump was using, and Giuliani clearly, were using corruption as a code word to mean Burisma and these alleged never proven, no, no basis for claiming it, uh, DNC servers in Ukraine. And the one useful barometer that we have for determining how corrupt a, requ a request that was, was to gauge it against other requests for corruption investigations, right? If you want a country to investigate corruption, presumably you, the things you identify specifically are the most important things. However, what we learned from Ambassador Yovanovitch's testimony the other day was that the U.S. under Trump already had three specific asks, anti-corruption asks. Sorry, four. There were three main policy ones and, and one sort of tactical one. There was um, uh, rounding up the people who had shot the Maidan protesters. There was cleaning up the prosecutors. And there was, oh, by the way, could you, could you end the money laundering and get back the $40 billion that the previous president stole us? And the other ask that, the, that Yovanovitch had was there was a cadre of anti-corruption protesters and activists in Ukraine who were being targeted by, for investigation by the prosecutor. And the U.S. position was, please don't do that. We want the same thing they want. They're not breaking any laws. And we believe in free speech and the right to, to mobilize and to organize for a clean government. So please don't do that. None of these things, these legitimate corruption agendas, none of these ever come up in the off-the-books, second-channel diplomatic efforts of the United States under Trump slash Giuliani. Then there's this. After Sondland was uh, summoned to testify to Congress, this is now Politico referring to Sondland's testimony, all of which is now out. So Sondland testifies that he bumped into Trump at the White House and told him, hey, I've been summoned to testify to Congress and I'm going to. And Trump simply responded, good, go tell the truth. The truth is one of those fun things where, and you see this in a lot of cases where, um, well, instead of telling it generally, I'll just say what happened next. Sondland said he also received unsolicited outreach from the White House Counsel's Office, and that's Trump. Let's be clear, right? The White House counsel are people whose job it is to protect Trump and to represent his interests. They are Trump. He received, Sondland received unsolicited outreach from the White House counsel's office asking him to come in for an interview to glean his recollection of events. That's the second half of Go Tell the Truth. The second half of Go Tell the Truth is, um, so by the way, what is the truth? <laughs> because, and then part three is, here's the way I remember the truth. Does that sound about right to you? Does it? That's generally the way these kind of things go. And we, we, we see this literally in, in criminal cases, um, not, your, not your executive branch criminal cases, street level crime criminal cases, standard witness intimidation. Now here's where the White House is also going wrong, and I want to make a bigger point about the White House on this. White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham released a statement in response to Sondland's new, new testimony. Quote, Ambassador Sondland squarely states that he did not know and still does not know when, why, or by whom the aid was suspended. He also said he presumed there was a link to the aid, but cannot identify any solid source for that assumption. The problem, and I... You know, incompetence, corruption, it's, it's always tough to know. But in, and especially when there's grounds to believe in both. The problem with bringing in all these inexperienced people because their lack of experience helps ensure their loyalty to you is their lack of experience makes them not good at being loyal to you. When he, so when, when Grisham puts all of the weight of, of right, the, she's making Sondland's statement, a load-bearing statement, by putting the weight of their denial on this, claiming that it's it, that they're uh, in some way exonerated, what she's leaving out is 
they're allowed to talk to him again. They're allowed to press him on his presumption and that he did not know why, why the aid was suspended. And, and also, he doesn't have to know. Again, this is inexperience with how these cases work, how any kind of criminal legal case works. Any one witness does not have to provide all the testimony. Sure, that's, that's nice and convenient, but if you need exhibits A, B, C, and D to convict someone, it doesn't matter that witness A gives you exhibit A if you're getting B, C, and D from others or already have it. And so it's just, it's just really poorly done. Um, there was one more point I wanted to make, and I kind of already made it, so I think I'm going to scratch that and, and just say that I think the bottom line here is that we're seeing that uh, the, the White House is not good at this. And that's not a big revelation, but it does, it is going to have material impacts. There are and would be, could be better ways of defending the president. I don't mean ways with more integrity, but perhaps I even mean less, but the Republican party is now paying a collective price. And you can ask um, soon to be ex Kentucky governor, Matt Bevins, whether he agrees or disagrees with me, but the fact that they are not good at this is going to have real world implications for them and the party. And, and you know, it's a, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's that, let's be grateful as Thanksgiving comes up that they are not good at this. And with that, um, I've gone on for way too long. So let's see what you folks have to say. And if you're new to us, first of all, thank you for joining us and you can subscribe and, um, join the conversation live every weekday at 1130. And the reason I do do it live is so that we can have this interaction once I'm done with my spiel. Uh, let's see. Um, some problems with the notifications. So uh, I'm sorry about that. I, I have my own problems navigating YouTube as regular viewers know, but I will say that I do my darndest to make it at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So you can set your, your own notification, I hope, if you're motivated and moved to, to join me. I hope you will be. Um, Reptile Z says, snow this morning in Winona, Minnesota. Honey Badger don't care. Uh, Ian James Chapman has some new poll numbers. What the hell? Let's, let's play. Let's, sim since I'm... <laughs> since I'm apparently MSNBC, let's talk polls. Biden 23, Warren 23, Sanders 20, Buttigieg 9, Harris 5, Klobuchar 2, Yang 3, Booker 3, Gabbard 0, O'Rourke obviously is out now, Steyer 1, Castro 0, Bennett 0. Okay, that's today and, and um, we'll have more. Uh, DLJ says, breaking news, new climate change accord, rest of the world agrees to build a wall around the US. So. One thing that I, I really took heart from, and I'm glad to see a response to the climate change stuff because we've got to make that coverage work if we want Democrats or anyone to take it seriously. And let's not forget that a sizable cohort, if not a majority of Republicans, Republican Americans believe that climate change is man-made and want to pursue solutions to it before Houston floats away. Um, so the other aspect of that New York Times piece that was so heartening was that and this is sort of the libertarian case for small government. So I apologize because I'm a, you know, I think there are obvious cases to be made for big government, climate change being a massive case, but we are seeing municipalities in other countries having to step up and fill the gap. And there's a really interesting aspect of the climate change um, pullout, which could end up to bite President Trump on the butt, which is that the EU is now talking about penalizing the US. In other words, Trump is saying, well, we can't afford to fight climate change. And, and the EU, just like it punishes, just like the Paris Accords punish countries that don't uh, meet their stated climate goals, it also gives them at least the green light to go ahead and, and tell the US, you know what, if you're not hitting certain climate goals, we don't care whether you're part of the treaty or not we're going to levy some tariffs on you or whatever it might be. So there's the, the thing with climate change is we're going to pay the cost. That's a given. The only question is, will we act soon enough to minimize the cost? And 
how many human lives will be part of that cost and how many how much uh, global discord and dystopia will be also a part of that cost. But either way, we're going to pay it. It's just a question of when, how much, and in what form. Uh, no Metal Ground says, this is bad. Along with California fighting to keep their automotive standards, I can't believe Bush still carries any weight at all. So here's the thing. It's not that Bush uh, carries weight per se. It's more that Bush provides evidence that a future Republican could come in after President Klobuchar or whomever it is and then undo it again. In other words, it's not Bush specifically. It's the pattern it's the fact that, Bo that Trump is not an aberration. It's the fact that Trump is just part of an ongoing pattern. It doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Bush or, you know, uh, President Santorum, <laughs> whenever his day finally comes. Um, the point is the rest of the world can't count on a committed, stable uh, effort by the United States to fight climate change. Matt Mungan says, I recently always get the notifications several minutes into the stream. Uh, and I used to, Matt, Matt, I guess partly that's my fault. I used to, here's the, there's always trade-offs, right? I used to blather on just, just randomly saying, hey guys, what's up? How's my audio for the first minute? And then I would cut that off once I was done being live so that people didn't have to sit through that. And the reason I did it was so that people had time to join. Um, and the reason I stopped doing that is because when I edited out that chunk at the beginning, the chat in via which we are now communicating would disappear as a function of, of uh, um, YouTube's editing package. So uh, the trade-off was uh, you, you're probably getting them late because I'm not giving YouTube time to give them to you because I'm trying to preserve the live chat. So damned if I do, damned if I don't. And you guys too, I suppose. Uh, so I apologize for that. And if, you, if there's a consensus, whether you'd rather lose, lose the live chat or whatever, you know, it's a conversation. We can have that conversation. Uh, Generic2858 says, most of the time a stream is over by the time I see the notification. This is probably why X-Force wants me to do three hours every day. I know you don't really want three hours, X-Force. I'm kidding you. Um, Oh, literally X Force is the next is the next uh, comment. Says hi all. What did I miss? You missed everything that I, that I said up until now. But it's okay because I'm not going to edit it out, so you can see it all later. Later. Um, X Force says, "Smash that like button, mortals!" Wow, that's some passion. X Force, link to your show. You, everyone, you're always telling me that I need to have more passion in these things. Um, and uh, I don't say smash. That's a good word to use for passion. Uh, let's see. Eve Guzman says, Guzman, I'm going to fake my Swedish accent there, says, can't wait for the televised interviews. Yes. Yes. So much yes. Um, and, and not only for the, for the real visceral impact of seeing people, the faces of people uh, under oath telling these stories, but also America will get to see the fact that there are Republicans in the room too, and their performance will be judged as well. Uh, X-Force says, everyone shut up. I can't concentrate with all this chitter chatter. Uh, let's see. Um, it bounced ahead of me again. See, every time I try to move down to keep up, it, uh, YouTube, we've, we've decided we don't like you. Um, let's see. x Force says, nothing to see here, Jonathan. Great show. See you tomorrow, LMAO. Um, Eve Guzman says, it's 85 in the Inland Empire. Going to be a hot winter again. I'm scared, but also jealous. Uh, you know, being here in the metropolitan New York area. Uh, Felicia Ritter says, so what was Trump's reaction to Sondland's changes in testimony? So I hope you caught it, but I read the statement from Stephanie Grisham, the White House press secretary, talking about how, of course, this proves he's innocent, simply because Sondland isn't specific about so how he knows some of these things, as if he can't be called back to testify to re-refresh his, his recollection, and as if no other witnesses can be asked, 
did Sondland tell you why he believed the, the aid was conditioned on a public, public, public statement? Leroy Beresford says, uh, love your work, sir. I hope Evans doesn't try to do what Scott Walker did in Wisconsin when he lost the governor's seat trying to weaken his power. So Leroy, I hope I'm, I'm saying your name correctly. I guess some people say Leroy. Um, I don't recall seeing your name, so if you're new, thank you so much for being here and for the kind words. Uh, it means a lot every time we get um, someone new to the conversation. I'm always excited and gratified to hear that and hear that someone's getting finding some value in what we do. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, that was that was, uh, Scott Walker, if I remember correctly, after Scott Walker lost in Wisconsin, uh, the state legislature there basically passed a, a law or a suite of laws dramatically reducing the governor's power. It was it was about as undemocratic a move as you can get, but not unprecedented in our national or state level politics, of course. Uh, let's see. Dave C. says, our best hope of impeaching Trump is to single out those in the administration who have everything to lose by protecting him. And I think, I think that's a really astute thing to say, he said, sucking up to the viewers. But I also think that's really tough in an environment where there is zero accountability for these people. Um, you know, you can turn on various cable news networks, for instance, and see people who were part of what remains the most egregious uh, foreign policy, if not any policy, uh, horror of modern American history, and the people who were part and parcel of that, some have, have mea culpa, some meh, not so much, but almost none of them have actually been exiled from the public sphere. They've got, you know, they've got contracts with the cable news networks. They're considered reliable, smart, um, commentators on who we are today. So the idea that there's going to be, um, you know, some sort of civically enforced karma is not as powerful as it might have been once in our history and perhaps ought to be now. Lee Alexander says, climate change has become one of my two top issues. They go hand in hand. The other is money and politics. Yeah, they do. They do go hand in hand. And I'm, I'm, certainly with you on climate change. I'm, I'm more of a rogue when it comes to money in politics, uh, less because I doubt the toxicity of money in politics and more because I am dubious of the uh, efficacy of, of the sort of standard package of reforms intended and advertised as being capable of, of ending that. So I don't know. Generic 2858 says we're all doomed, which is too bad, um, but also has always been the case, right? No one gets to live forever. So I think, um, and, and various other generations have lived with, with uh, equally horrifying swords over, over their heads in some form or, or another. And I think it's important that we still, that we not let the apocalypticness, well, for a couple things. One is, we're in a time, I think, socially where, um, and I don't think this is virtue signaling, but we want to make clear that we grasp the severity or enormity. Look it up. It doesn't mean big. It means evil. I mean, it means both, but evil is a part of enormity. Um, the way we signal severity or enormity is by expressing things in maximalist terms. So a lot of people talk about climate change meaning the end of the earth. It's not the end of the earth. It's going to be a slow grinding degradation, maybe not too slow, but maybe very grinding, degradation of quality of life for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. Um, not to mention the various flora and fauna changes and all of that. But it's not the end of the earth. Uh, and so, one, we, we express things in apocalyptic terms, and then two, to honor the, the severity and enormity that we've just expressed, we don't allow ourselves enough, I think, moments of happiness and joy. It all feels guilt-laden because we're not spending those moments, um, you know, fighting the power. And 
I don't know exactly how to square that circle, but there's got to be a way, right? Um, uh, if you've watched long enough, you've probably heard that I mentioned uh, comic books, that I, that I mentioned the fact that I collect comic books, and I don't have the money to chase World War II era comic books, but they were out there, and uh, they were huge. Comic books were huge. Escapism was, was huge during World War II, uh, including comics about World War II. Um, you know, you had, um, there's a famous uh, Superman cover, cover from, my, I believe, before the end of the war, where Superman, I think, has, uh, has Hitler and Tojo, maybe Mussolini. He's basically carrying them through the, through the sky. And it's escapist, but it's about the time you're in. And, I, and I'm not sure that, you know, we, I think we're emotionally as a culture in a different place. And I'm not sure what the best place to be is. But um, I guess on an individual level, I would ask that we're, we're all doomed since birth. Um, and we shouldn't let that certainty deprive us as, of making what we have a positive, fulfilling, enriching um, experience, I hope. Reed Rasmussen says Republicans should be 12% on the Congress, not 55. Thanks, Electoral College and gerrymandering. Uh, X Force says money in politics has to be the number one issue. Um, I disagree. Uh, has to be the n number one issue. Until you correct that, nothing else can change. I disagree. Um, Lee Alexander says Coca Industries is purchasing favor with corporate Dems, and then names a couple people. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Lee. I'd be curious to see it, so please print a link, uh, post a link. That's the only reason I didn't mention the names you mentioned is because I'm not comfortable giving oxygen to that claim without knowing what's behind it. Uh, Reed says, money in politics is a top issue. Both parties are corrupted by big donor money. Uh, the public have no voice because of this. I just saw some some nice comment about me, and then immediately uh, <laughs> it went away. Um, let's see if I can... Okay, I see. Uh, X-Force says, good move, though, Jonathan. I vote keep the live chat. So that's one vote for keeping the live chat, meaning don't, don't edit off the beginning. So start right away, and then we'll just have to live with the uh, lagging indicator of notifications. Uh, Reed Rasmussen, Rasmussen says, laws are made to benefit corporate interests, not public interests. DLJ, DLJ, hello DLJ, says, the solution to losing the live chat problem, start the stream with some intro music. I think that has its own issues, one of which being, I'm not sure how I would live stream it, and the, and the music would have to be uh, you know, not, it would have to be public domain. Um, Reed Rasmussen says, Citizens United is the most unconstitutional law ever passed. Uh, Felicia Reeder says, U.S. needs to go all in commitment on climate change and stick with commitment. And, and again, I, I will say that as laudable and important and brave, politically brave, the Green New Deal and, and other progressive packages on climate change are, even if they were all enacted tomorrow, right, actually passed into law, actually enforced, and, you know, we had seen this dramatic transformation of our economy and our environmental footprint entirely live up to the ambitions of that package one year from now, even then, 15, 20 years from now, I think people would still book, look back and say, wait, you knew in the 1980s, if not before, that cars and cows and meat, consumption of meat and, and, and cars and energy production, coal-fired energy, you knew that all of that stuff was erasing the shield that, kept, that keeps you safe from the nuclear, the massive nuclear reaction, 93 million miles, miles away, and he didn't outlaw cars the next day? What were you thinking when you did not outlaw cars? Explain that to me. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but 
Um, and I, I should also say, I think that people are craving um, a radical uh, response. People want to do something, right? If you if you tell people, you know, you see people going nuts saying, I, I won't get, I won't use plastic straws, excuse me, and carpooling and buying Priuses and electric cars and, and all this stuff. People are trying on their own to do things that they have no guarantee will even matter, right? So imagine if the public policy was basically, we're about to do something really hard and we need your help to make it happen. We're going to get rid of cars and, or at least fossil fuel cars, and here's how we're going to do it. And it's going to be a pain. And for, um, for the next year, we're going to ask you uh, to take trains or to carpool with people who own hybrid vehicles or whatever it might be. But we're going to ask you to do that uh, because that's how you can save the world. Imagine how someone who could actually speak to the public, <laughs> unlike me, could frame a message like that as an insp inspirational thing to do. When's the last time we had a call to action? Remember the last call to action we had? An, the, an inspirational call for Americans to come together and do something for the betterment of the country slash the world? It was after 9-11. And the call to action then was go out and shop. Uh, if you don't remember it, I can't tell you how soul-crushing a moment that was. And for an atheist to feel like their soul is crushed, it's got to be soul-crushing. Reptile Z has a really nice idea here, telling me to post an alternative email address where the peeps you reach here can communicate with you with developed composed thought. Chat doesn't work well for that. So what? that's a really good idea. What I've been doing is, um, because it's self-serving, <laughs> is I've been saying, hey, hit me up at Twitter. That's at JT Larson, J-T-L-A-R-S-E-N, um, and talk with me there. But, you know, you're right. Some people might not want to be out like that. Some people might not be on Twitter, so I should get the um, the big brains back in LA to hook me up with uh, an email address or find out if I have one that I just haven't paid attention to and um, put that out there. Um, we do have a tip line, but that's purely for tips, so I should not, th I should not use that. Uh, Amanda K says, when a Democrat fixes what a Republican has done just so a Republican can just come and undo everything, it's so upsetting. How can we count on any of our leadership? It depresses me to think about. Yeah, sorry. Me too. Felicia Ritter says, only way the U.S. can regain credibility with the global community is to be consistent with climate change commitment. And the question there would be, well, for how long? Over, over how many administrations? Over how many parties? Uh, you know, I don't know. Lee Alexander says, I wish for a warm winter, but don't expect one. I'm afraid to. I may be disappointed. The Dem, and then goes on, the Dems need to learn to stand with the working class if they want the large, larger number of voters. Um, I would expand that because working class is sometimes used as, as and I'm not saying you, you meant it this way, but working class is often used as kind of like a, First of all, it can be like a dog whistle, meaning working must mean white people. And obviously that's, uh, I'm assuming you don't mean that, but it gets read that way. But the other point I wanted to mention about that phrase is that it's also often used as, as a synonym for middle class. And the, the total invisibilification of the poor in this country is, is another real real problem. And we haven't seen Democrats take a stand, an active, forceful, passionate stand for poor people and say, you know, there are poor people in this country. There are people who go to bed hungry. There are people who make sacrifices so that their kids can eat. There are people who, who uh, you know, need to take drug tests or other dehumanizing things in order to qualify for aid. And it's messed up and we have to do something about it. Um, not so that the middle class is, is no longer afraid of it, but because it's wrong. Because the, those are human beings just as much as, as Jeff Bezos is. Um, and... 
Eve Guzman says, I'm so happy that naked corruption is being exposed. A younger generation is growing up and is more aware. Let's hope complacency does not set in. Yeah, I mean, this is always the case, right? It's, always, it's almost always younger generations that are um, more progressive, but they get older and that changes. And uh, as, they, as they get more conservative, they also vote more. Um, so there's some interesting, we're seeing some interesting demographic changes right now, but there's no guarantee that these will, won't change, these won't follow past patterns. As that, as that generation gets older. Uh, X-Force says, Citizens United, First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti and Buckley versus Vallejo are the three Supreme Court decisions that have brought us to where we are and we need to be reversed and need to be reversed through law. So here's, here's one question that I tend to have about money in politics, which is George W. Bush was really the last money in politics guy to win the presidency. Um, the money in the 2016 primaries was not behind Donald Trump by any means. Um, and the money behind the money in um, 2000 in the 2008 Democratic primaries was not behind Barack Obama. So I guess I'm just sort of empirically unsure how how I'm not saying there's no effect but I tend to think it happens, it, it exerts itself more on policy and lawmaking once people are in power. And maybe it's just that it, it has less ability to affect the, the presidential election because the presidential elections are also more than um, congressional elections. They're sort of, you know, proxy popularity contests. X-Force says the real problem is epistemological when you think about it. I'm not, I'm not sure if that dot, 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 when you think about it is meant to be a, a meta-referential joke, but if it is, I kind of like it. Uh, X-Force says, you are my happiness and joy, Jonathan, and all the good people here. I'm so glad, that that's very kind of you to say, I'm so glad you said, and all the good people here, because the weight of it being just me was a little intimidating there for a minute. But thank you, X-Force. And you guys certainly are mine too, because I... I will confess, I spend most of my morning dreading this. <laughs> wait, wait, hear me out. Because I feel pressure to come up with something worth saying. And that pressure is anxiety inducing. And I beat myself up for being lazy about it and not smart enough about it and all that stuff. Um, but I, I, as you can see, I probably smile <laughs> a lot more um, during this moment when I'm doing the live chat uh, with you guys than I do in any similar period during the rest of the day. Uh, Tanya Roebuck says, Alaska, Alaska might just set a new precedent about money and politics and is pushing it up to the Supreme Court. It said it might give room to challenge Citizens United. I'm not familiar with that case. That's interesting. Um, all right, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. Sorry. Sorry, X-Force. Chaleco says, I know that in Stowe, Vermont, the ski slope owners are worried their business may fall, fail over the next few years due to current climate change. I wonder whether the artificial snowmakers are thinking business will do better though, right? There's, there's, no matter what happens, it's sort of like Wall Street in a way, right? Wall Street makes money whether on the sale, regardless of whether you're buying or selling. Um, uh, Lee Alexander says, now that I've given you the basics, investigate. <laughs> they are based out of Kansas, if it matters. Um, Lee, I assume you're referring to the, the Cokes, and I, I, I don't know if you posted, um, oh, I think you're just talking in general about the Cokes. So um, I am a poorly trained investigative reporter. So when you say, here boy, investigate, I tend not to listen. Um, I, I, have looked into Koch Brothers stuff before. We've published, I guess it's just Koch Brother now, isn't it? RIP. Sorry, RIP, as the kids say. Uh, but um, I, I don't do investigations on demand. Um, and also I try to look at areas where it seems like not a lot of people are and a lot of progressive institutions 
have been and are looking at the Cokes. So it doesn't feel to me like there's an unmet need there. So um, I apologize, but uh, unless, unless I'm aware of a specific area related to the Cokes where those criteria apply, I'm probably not likely to, to dig into it just because, you know, of who the Cokes are. X-Force says, young people were carrying tiki torches in Charlottesville too. That's a good point. It, no generation is monolithic. So um, I'm not a boomer, although the more the beard comes in, the more I'll likely be mistaken for a boomer. But I find the OK Boomer um, meme a little frustrating because uh, I think ageism is bad. And um, that's not just because I'm getting older. I thought so when I was young as well. And um, I've made a point in the past of trying to uh, not be ageist in my hiring, certainly. Uh, William Martyr says, the question is, what's in that snow when they make it in the sky? Uh, and of course, I lost it because I tried to move. Uh, in the sky, I mean. The endothermic chemicals that they're using to create cooler weather over the U.S. are generally highly toxic. Well, that's certainly another point. Um, X-Force clarifies that ep epistemological was a joke. Thank you. Um, let's see. If I'm skipping over your stuff, it sometimes just means I don't feel sufficiently informed to give it a responsible airing, so I apologize. Please don't take it personally. Um, Lee Alexander says, the multicultural working class ranging from the poor up to the upper managerial class. Not to say the wealthy shouldn't get the percentage of attention due to them, which of course they should. I suspect you mean a very different kind of attention, Lee, which certainly makes sense. Um, X-Force clarifies about those Supreme Court cases. It's not just about money, it's about endowing corporations with constitutional rights, calling money speech, and allowing dark money and unlimited donations. I certainly am on board with um, the, the growing uh, legal standing that corporations and their owners enjoy. As a brief aside, um, I never actually published a story on this, but when Matt, God, I'm blanking on his name now. The guy was acting attorney general of the United States and I'm blanking on his name. Whitaker, maybe? Um, when he first took the position, um, I tracked down a copy of the one, <laughs> the one law review article that he ever wrote, and it was about LLCs, limited liability corporations. And I was kind of stunned because it's a limited liability corporation is exactly what it says. It's very convenient, the name. It basically says the owners of this corporation, as individual human beings, have limited liability for what the corporation does. In other words, we, the individual, the owners, have created this thing through which we can reach our grubby little arms and do whatever we want, but accountability stops with this legal fiction and doesn't reach me. And I was kind of stunned to see that this was essentially invented in the 80s, I think in the tax code, and then states in, a growing, uh, in growing numbers began to implement and make it real so that individuals could do this. It's a batty concept, it's bananas. Why is there an LLC? I mean, I get the basic point that you want to encourage people to uh, take some risks, uh, some entrepreneurial risks when they create companies without, without um, you know, risking total personal bankruptcy and homelessness, but there's gotta be a, a, another way than, than basically allowing rich individuals to siphon money out of the economy to, to be extractive without any kind of uh, accountability or responsibility for how they do it. It's nuts. It's nuts. Okay. Uh, I'm running out of steam. So I'm going to, I also have other stuff to do. I have to tape for TYT members um, a Thanksgiving message about what I'm thankful for. So I have to think about a good way to tell TYT members who will see videos from a bunch of TYT people talking about what they're thankful for. I have to say, I have to figure out a graceful but still entertaining way to say that I'm grateful for you, for showing up every day, for the um, your financial support of TYT generally and TYT investigates specifically. X4 says, I think you should do call-ins so I can call and talk for half an hour. 
Um, Reptile Z says, keep on keeping on, JL. Thank you, Reptile. Uh, it may not seem so, but you are showing the power of courage. Great stuff today. Every day I think about the things I'm not saying because I lack the intestinal fortitude, but that's kind of you to say. I, I try, right? I aspire. Um, as for call-ins, I would love to do call-ins. I would love to do live two-ways. I interviewed Jeff Charlotte, the author of The Family, the basis for that Netflix documentary. The problem with those is that then I can't do the live back and forth. So it's possible I'm, I'm something of a Luddite when it comes to YouTube and streaming. But maybe there are ways out there that I can have my cake and eat it to do call-ins, but also have live, do two ways, but also have live. I don't know. Um, so I will... Um, oh, Leah Alexander says, investigate was an LOL comment. I wasn't serious. I apologize. I took that overly serious because I get all the time people telling me, go investigate. And when I, when I demur, that scene is like, well, you're, you're obviously bought and paid for. You're in on it. Okay, I guess, sure, <laughs> why not? Um, so um, anyway, I apologize for being overly sensitive about that. Uh, like I said, I, I, I try to do something of a cost benefit analysis. What can I look into where I'm likely to come up with, and when I say I, I mean TRT investigates, and that includes Ken Klippenstein, our senior investigative reporter. What can I do, what can we do that we're, is likely to yield results, because that matters, and is likely to yield results that have a material impact on people's lives, as opposed to just being about um, you know, generating outrage or uh, stirring up hate or division or things like that. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty narrow area. Um, last year, this time, I was looking at the National Prayer Breakfast simply because I thought they weren't getting looked at in the mainstream media in ways that I thought I had something to bring to the table. And we broke some stories as a result. Um, I'm, I am proud to say and also grateful to say because when I say as a result, I also mean as a result of you and your support. So with that, I'm going to say please take care of each other at least as well as you take care of me. And certainly take care of yourselves. And I'll see you tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And that is your notification for tomorrow's edition of TYTI Daily. Bye, guys.